welcome to this special new series on Bloomberg Quint, where we speak with leaders from across business and professions to talk about their failures, the lessons they learned from them, and the mental construct that one needs when one enters any new area of excellence on being able to fall down and get up back again onto your feet. Well, today I have with me a man who is unabashedly talking about failures on his social media platform, Harsh Mariwala, the person who's built Marico, uh, one of our better known industrial leaders in the country. Mr. Mariwala is the chairman of Marico, which is a very well known Indian FMCG firm. Uh, Mr. Mariwala, thank you very much for joining us thank on this you. new series. I'm going to start by quoting you back at you. In yeah. one previous interview, you said, you win some and yes. you learn some. Got it. And I really like the way you phrase that. Yes. Uh, and so I think I'd start with a slightly broader question on has your approach to failure changed from the time in 1971 mm -hmm. when you joined what was Bombay Oils yes. and then the way you built Marico up into a several thousand crore company now? So I would say that many times um, if you're young and if you have that fear of failure, mm -hmm. then you will not take any risks. Mm -hmm. And failure is a part and parcel of our lives. When you're a kid, if you have to walk, you mm -hmm. fall many times. You just cannot start walking on day one, you know. Right. So I think that kid example is a very good example. I like it because a kid falls multiple times before the kid starts walking, you know. So I would say that one should not be afraid of failure, and I still am not afraid of failures. But you can de-risk failures by prototyping it on a small scale. Uh, so failure doesn't have to have a huge impact financially. But you should not be scared of failing. It's okay to fail, I'm saying, because if you've done good work and if you fail, for whatever reason, there is always some learning out of that failure. That's why I said sometimes you win and sometimes you learn and not lose. I know, I like the way you phrased it a lot. I've sort of grouped the kind of learnings you've had or yeah. the lessons you've had into two or three different kind of, yeah. you know, sort of yeah. groups or exp sets of experiences. Yeah. I think the first one you described to me had to do with the lack of a professional structure in the very early years as you were transitioning from Bombay Oil to Marico and some of the things that went wrong there. Yes. Uh, can you talk us through some of that briefly so that we get a better sense of how you learned through that process? Yes, I think uh, the background is that I have not had any core or a mentor in my Great. journey yeah and nobody has taught me anything I joined an organization which was a completely family managed organization mm -hmm. no professionals and I had to do everything on my own I had to learn everything on my own and in that journey uh, when you're young you think you know it all and sometimes uh, you take shortcuts mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes you're not aware what you are stepping into so in my initial days I've had two or three failures which were more process led or which were because we didn't have a specialized uh, talent to manage that particular uh, function mm -hmm. or that angle of business. So I had fallen into a trap in the area of taking some shortcuts on the legal side. Okay. And uh, I so should have had were, a legal uh, These were known counsel. violations no, or not, unknown, unknown violations, violations simply just because, uninformed? Because I was not aware and you know, I, so it's not known violations. Okay. But it really opened up my eyes because, you know, it, uh, when you are, it was not a serious allegation, serious lapse. Sure. But uh, at least you get shaken up that, okay, I should have done that, you know, right. how come it missed out? And I think that led me to establish a legal function within the organization that sure. I think we have to be far more, um, far more careful on legal issues because if you are not, then you can be put back by many years, you know. Mm -hmm. And we've seen many examples of ignorance or... Uh, sometimes people knowingly evade the law, that's, that's fraud. Worst. Yeah, that's different. But in my case, it was ignorance. But I think that really helped me. And similarly, when we launched a new product against uh, big uh, multinationals, we had launched many, many years back a tooth powder. You know, mm -hmm. when we thought we uh, we could develop a tooth powder formulation, but when you go to a vendor and ask him, ask him or her to develop the formulation. There are shortcuts, so there are no process, quality of, quality process of actually getting consumer feedback and, you know, fine-tuning the product based on consumer preferences. And we took some shortcut route and realized that the product was not meeting the consumer needs. Mm. And that again, that failure led me to establish a new product development wing where then we started working on not only the 
the formulation side, but working very closely with the consumer. Mm. Because in an FMCG kind of products, it's very important that you get the consumer's voice or consumer's views mm. on the product and fine tune the product uh, depending on what the consumer wants. Mm. So I think that led to a new product development. Um, and similarly, a quality failure where we we didn't have a very strong quality assurance function and we ran into some quality problems. Uh, so again, went into far more structured quality assurance uh, yeah. department in the organization. But this was very, very small at that time. We were in, may have been doing a turnover of a couple of crores or maybe five or ten crores. And um, I think I went through that uh, those those failures, but ultimately at the end of it, it resulted in something far more robust, which has helped us all the way up until now, whether it's quality assurance or product development or the legal side of business. These sound like early stage, you know, uh, issues or challenges that you yes. faced. Uh, let's come to more the mid-stage mid challenges that yes. you've discussed with me. And I think the one recurrent theme in all the incidents that you recounted uh, had to do with business model experimentation, if I may call it that. Yes, yes. And you've tried and they haven't worked out in the past. Yes. And if you can talk us through some of those illustrations yeah. and then we'll discuss, you know, how that changed the way you look at business or acquisition or expansion of any organic or inorganic style? Sure. So, uh, you know, and I'm talking of now um, a time period of around early 90s, you know, when uh, Marico began to cover the consumer products business of Bombay Oil Industries, we started exporting to markets where hair oiling habit existed, uh, and it existed mainly in uh, neighboring countries and Middle East markets. Mm. And we, I was very keen that we become a far more international company. Uh, and be present in many other uh, territories beyond just neighboring geographies. So it was very important for us to grow outside India because uh, I was looking at companies, multinationals who were in FMCG and when it came to attracting talent, they were able to offer individuals a posting outside India. Hmm. And I think that would be a very important uh, vehicle for attracting talent if you had some other uh, openings outside India. So our uh, desire to go international was multifold. One was to get higher growth, another is to get some outside in, in terms of what is happening in other markets and can it be relevant for India. And number three, to post our talent outside so they get an exposure internationally. And by then globalization, trends and that, all that began. So I wanted to go beyond that and um, uh, we were not able to do that because our business of hair oils was the only thing which could get uh, exported and traction mm -hmm. internationally. So we said that what else can get traction in other markets and one of the things which we identified was Ayurveda, you know, mm -hmm. because Ayurveda is Indian and uh, we were able to uh, acquire a company which was based on principles of Ayurveda in New York. Mm -hmm. And they were supplying uh, Ayurvedic products to the spa industry. This is Sundari that you're... This is Sundari. Uh, and uh, we thought that we will be able to add value. Uh, we were able to add value. We were able to increase turnover. But it was a different business model. You know, we were experienced in managing a fast-moving consumer goods which had mass distribution, which meant mass advertising on television or mass media. Uh, but this was meeting consumers, spa owners on a B2B basis. So from B2B C, B2C, we went to B2B. And it was a completely different business and we went through a huge learning curve. And uh, we realized that uh, looking at the distance of operating in US compared to India, we were just not getting that traction in terms of turnover. So we, we sold off that business. I think in 2009, if yeah. I'm not wrong, yes. But the key learning was can you identify some other categories where you can grow? Mm -hmm. uh, so we identified some other categories which are what we call pre and post wash hair care or ethnic hair care. And we were able to acquire companies in Egypt, in South Africa, in Vietnam, in FMCG space. So the business model remained same, mm -hmm. but uh, we changed the, some of the product categories we were uh, present in uh, through acquisition. Then I think that's worked out well. And so I, I, the, the point you told me when we were discussing this, and you said that uh, it's important to remember that you can't force fit a new business model into your existing business model. Um, but often a lot of corporate acquisition or a lot of corporate uh, you know, expansion yes. is driven on being able to uh, cash in on a new 
either category of products like you did eventually or a new way of doing business. Yes. So why in this case did it not work for you? Was it a company mindset? Yes. Was it something that you didn't care to be able to scale beyond a point? What was it? So I would say two or three. One is the company mindset of dealing in B2C versus B2B. We didn't and have any experience. You in couldn't change B2B. it, but there was no way and to learn tried, from your acquisition. We, we tried doing it. But number two, I think more importantly, the the scope of that business in US we thought it would be much more. People would buy into our Ayurveda story at that time. But it was, the traction was low. We were not only selling the spas, the, the Ayurvedic products, but also teaching them Ayurvedic ways of doing massage and all that, you know. So you were a little ahead of your time in that way? Uh, you could say that to some extent, yes. But today because it's Ayurveda very popular. Is, Ayurveda. <laughs> is caught on yeah. Ayurveda yoga, but at that time it was, maybe it was a little bit ahead of time also. Okay, so that's not really quite, I mean, it's a market timing failure, but it's not a Many failure. Many times failure. could be because of market timing. You're okay. absolutely right. Yeah. Have you had other experiences where you've attempted to, through an acquisition or through a new expansion, change business model, but that hasn't worked? Because that was a point that you repeatedly came back to when we were doing some of our pre-conversations. So one other business we went into was Kaya Skin Clinics. Yes. Which was a different business model. Completely, a service bar yeah, so model as opposed to, to a goods we went model. To use learning curve there. Yes. We made some mistakes and... Uh, we made a lot of mistakes which could have been avoided if we knew how to manage a service business because it is very different than a career product business. So I think my key advice to entrepreneurs if your business model changes dramatically, you have to have a new team, you have to have competencies which have worked with you rather than trying to send people from your existing business to that new business because the skills, competencies required in a new business are very, very different. Your mindset as an entrepreneur also has to be very, very different. And uh, I think we made some mistakes and we could have easily avoided those mistakes in Kaya. What struck me as interesting is, you know, when you said there are people decision failures yes. that any business leader goes through in the arc of his career. Yes. And I want you to talk a little bit about that because I think that doesn't get enough attention, right, when we talk about this. So, yes, I would say that people are the most important part in any organization and they are any organization's biggest asset. And I have spent personally a lot of time in culture building and in grooming talent and getting the right people on board. So I'm going back again in 90s where uh, Marico was formed and we had a new team when Marico began operations and they were all heading each function over a period of time. So we had an operations head, we had a finance head, we had a HR head. And they, have, they were with me for almost 10, 12 years and at some stage they started feeling that they need to they need to expand hmm. uh, their role or they need to do something differently. They were getting tired and I said that I have to retain them. So can I change the organization structure and give them new responsibility? Yeah. So I created a structure where we divided the company into two different profit centers, what we call healthcare and nature care. We put the operations head in nature care, we put the finance head in in healthcare, we put uh, the HR head in sales. Did it, it didn't work? work out well because it, it was it was more people first and the organization later. And I was trying to trying to force keep them happy. people, yeah. yeah, keeping them happy, retain them. Uh, and it was premature from an organizational point of view because we didn't have critical mass, and it didn't do well. And we had to disband that structure and go back to our earlier functional structure. You know. Did they stay with you? Uh, no, I think they left then because when you uh, did the restructuring, yeah, because then you know what role would they have? You know, again, they would not have gone back to their old roles. You know, and by by then I had already taken another finance head and another HR head, so they left over a period of time. Okay, so key learning from that is try and stick to core strengths of every function and task. I would say the organization's interests come first, and I have seen this many times. You have a conflict between promoter and and the organization and similarly some very good employee who has done extremely well for you you're really indebted to that person for the contribution that person has made but at some stage in the organization's journey that person is not able to live up to the challenges of the job or the growth challenges or whatever newer challenges and uh, many times uh, there's a guilt feeling amongst entrepreneurs that how can you ask that person to go um, but if you have that thumb rule of the organization, the interest come first, then it's better to dispense with that person uh, in the human manner. I'm not saying ask that person to go in the human manner so that uh, the organization's interests are taken care of first. And it has happened to me also a few times. 
I'll reduce that even to a team leader level, not just an entrepreneurial level, uh, but a more micro decision making level of yeah. team leaders where you have excellent performers yes. and you want to create new challenges for them. Yes. But sometimes those challenges exceed what the overall organization wants to do sure. or their own particular skill set. Sure. Um, but it's exactly like you said, a degree of guilt and a degree yeah. of debt yeah. and a degree of we don't want to lose you. Correct. Uh, that could lead to and some very. I think ultimately, everybody is connected, especially at the senior levels. You know, all the functions are connected. So, if I have a weak marketing person mm. who is not able to generate demand and very strong other functional heads, whether it's manufacturing or sales, then what will happen is you retain that person, but it is causing demotivation among the other functional heads. Right. And if you reward loyalty, other good guys will leave and the, and the non-performers will stay on, you know. Yeah. So it's not good from an organizational point of view. Okay. Uh, this brings me to, you know, one broader question. So we've discussed some of the individual experiences you've had. You know, when I look at this from an industry level, um, one of the things I asked you yesterday when we were talking about this, and I said, uh, there are various ways to look at failure. One way to look at it is also from an industry point of view, why has no Indian FMCG company come close to size uh, to the one or two fairly large multinational companies that we have in the country, for instance, in the Sun Unilever uh, you know, or Nestle? So I would want to compare this uh, journey in India about FMCG with some other countries. That's one way of looking at it. Okay. Because uh, whether it's Levers or Nestle or Procter & Gamble, they are present globally virtually in each and every country. So what has been the performance of local players in these countries is also one way to look at it. And uh, I think it so happened that this is one of the most deregulated industries mm. in the world. And to that extent, uh, the likes of other MNCs have gone into these countries much, much in advance, much before. Uh, in the India, local, I think companies. local companies have come in. And more importantly, the fact that they have global brands and they are present in each and every category of uh, FMCG, mm. they have a global experience. And on top of that, they have a backing of a global R&D. And they understand the global consumer. They understand distribution. So their part, past experience of them dealing in various geographies and various categories for a much longer period of time has helped them to become much, much uh, bigger. Mm. And they also, their presence was much earlier than many of the FMCG companies, like we. But would you do, would you only put it down to first mover advantage or head no, start? No, I would say it's a combination of first mover advantage, uh, deep knowledge of the categories, uh, a lot of R&D work done globally. Uh, so a combination of these three, four things, and the set of competencies in terms of sales and distribution, uh, marketing competencies, which the Indian companies uh, had to acquire, learn, and you know. But I must say, at the same time, compared to many other countries, Indian companies have done not badly. I mean, there are five, oh, six. Oh, I'm not companies suggesting badly at all. Done it well yeah. because whether it's Marico, whether it's Dabur or Godrej or or Imami or Britannia, all of them have got a critical mass, and they are very well respected in the capital markets also. I was also wondering if it's the failure to scale. I mean, because, you know, the ability to fail and stand up again comes hand in hand with ambition. Um, but somewhere, did Indian entrepreneurs fall short of leadership ambition? No, I wouldn't Size think so. ambition, no, scale ambition? No, I wouldn't think so. Because in FMCG, what happens globally is one or two out of ten new products succeed. So for an Indian FMCG to succeed, you have to try multiple times for an FMCG company, um, MNC FMCG company, uh, some of the categories they have already perfected in some other countries and it's a matter of cut and paste with some local changes. And but surely you can also learn from their failures? You are, I mean now no, this information is you, widely whether it's available. The brand or it's the pricing or the formulation because the consumer behavior is very complex. So many times Indian, Relatively, Indian companies may have failed much more because they have not gone through an experience curve. And for the same MNCs, they may have gone through failure experience curve in some other countries. For example, Dove, you know, they have perfected Dove in many, many countries. So they know exactly what to do in India. And we, if we had a category, say, like Dove or a brand like Dove, we would have to go through the learning curve, you know. So in your lifetime, you don't think that there would be an 
Indian born FMCG company uh, that might outdo in size uh, you know, and something. in financials. Yes. Very tough. Uh, no, Hindustan Unilever, which is also an Indian company, yeah. I'm not suggesting, but it has a multinational parent. Uh. It's very tough to beat them, if you ask me, because they are in virtually each and every category. And I mean, they are not going to take it lying down the fact that they are market leaders in many categories. They will, I mean, they will fight their way. So uh, if you ask me, will any FMCG company beat levers in terms of size in the near future? The answer in is India. clearly no. I zero percent chance I would say. Zero percent. Zero percent chance. I believe you take that bet. But is that even was that ever an ambition for you? In terms not of really, I mean size, no, not to they, beat lever. Because relatively but size. I mean we have when we started we were like they were hundred times ours. Today no, they may be I don't about four or five times ours. Was Three, your ambition times. ever linked to size? Uh, of course, I'm now coming to, be to risk appetite size, because I want to talk I, about I risk appetite. We, we could look at what they had achieved by then, you know. So I'm saying size, yes, we need a critical mass. We need a certain scalable size. But to say that we should have beaten them, I don't think at that time, even if I had that vision, I would don't think we would have done that. We would have been able to do that or anybody else would have. So it is not a lack of vision. No, no, of course it's not. Yeah. Let me rephrase it. What I meant is that, so I'm trying to understand ambition. Therefore, the ability to take failure and, and come back up, because without ambition, that would be very difficult to do, yeah. and how to link these two. And therefore, I said, was size, what was your driving ambition? Okay, let me, let me keep it open-ended. What was your driving ambition? Our driving ambition was to whatever we do. Your driving ambition? Yes. Not Marico's, your no, driving My driving ambition in FMCG has always been that whatever we do in that segment of market, we should be market leaders. Okay. okay? So if you look at all our products, today we are market leaders. Mm. But in that particular segment, now for example in shampoos, we are present only in anti lice shampoos. So you are a market small, leader in there? In medical. Mm. In, in cooking oils, we are only present through Sephora, which is premium, healthy mm. cooking so oils. So in that subsection only that of cooking, segment, yeah. Or in coconut oil, we are market leader through, or in hair oils, we are market leader through a whole set of brands. Or in starch, we are market leaders in Revive. Or in uh, gels, uh, creams, we are market leaders through set, set red, red. Uh, parachute. So I think market leadership is something which I have aspired to do. In, um, but at the same time in what we call beauty and wellness. Okay. And now we are market leaders in oats, masala oats. So basically market leadership gives you very good financial returns. And I think that's been one of my And weaker players relatively I've seen in most... Uh, most sectors they fall apart you know and see you're seeing today in India a consolidation taking place in virtually in each and every sector whether it's telecom three players left or many other sectors banks also is getting more and more uh, narrower. Uh, yeah narrower and people are getting the merge mergers happening so it's a global phenomenon that in an industry you'll have more two or three players and it's consolidated because of weak players so I didn't want to be a weak player in a segment if I had gone into shampoo, I would have been number eight or ten. You know, I, I cannot succeed. Okay, fair yeah. enough. You spoke right at the beginning about how a child is not fearful of learning to walk, <coughs> falls down, gets up yeah. all over again. Um, but that ability somewhere gets dissipated as you become older yeah. and you become more successful. Yes. How have you navigated that? Because even today, the last time I spoke with you, you were talking about yet another new business that you were looking to get into. So I am not afraid of failures. Uh, it, I think people, what will people think of me is something, it's not a financial, many times it's not a financial risk. How will I be perceived by others if I fail? So that ego getting negatively impacted is a huge thing. So if you don't have an ego, then to that extent uh, you will not have that fear of failure. You don't have an ego? I don't know. I <laughs> but let's put it that way that I'm willing to accept uh, failures, willing to experiment and learn from those failures. So it's okay to fail, you know. It's, I, I don't want to fail as a business business. I, if tomorrow Marico failed as an organization, I would really get deeply hurt. But if something new I'm doing and it didn't do well, or in Marico also, if we launch some product that didn't do well, then it's okay to fail. We have to celebrate failures if it is, if a proper homework is done. Since 1971, you also created a, a, a method, maybe, to de-risk 
so that when you are taking new chances or new shots, uh -huh. uh, you're at least reducing with every new chance and every new ch shot. Uh, you're reducing the probability of failure, right? Hopefully, yes. Yeah. So how do you go about doing that? I mean, is there a, a, a matrix you have in your mind that you apply? Because I do know you follow, uh, you know, very well-known business and management guru, yeah. Ram Charan, yeah. and I know that you've worked with him yeah. over the last several decades yeah. now uh, to build some construct. Yeah. So I'm yeah. curious. So I would say that uh, all the failures which have occurred in the past, a lot of them have to be done with the consumer side of it, you know. The ability to get deep into consumer's mind is one. Number two, a certain critical mass in terms of, you need to have a certain critical mass and you would, at least I, I like scale. Mm -hmm. So if you, the business may be okay, but if it is not getting scale, then I will not get happy, you know. So we need to have a certain critical mass. Number three, you need to have competency in terms of what are you pursuing. And if you don't have the competency, so you have to in invest in these competencies in advance before you start that business and not, not when you launch the product because then that may be too late, you know. Uh, and fourth is more importantly, innovate and go on perpetually, understand what's working, what's not working in the marketplace, you know. Don't be a me too, but try and offer something which is differentiated in the marketplace because if you're a me too in a highly competitive environment your chances of success will be lower compared to some innovation or compared to some pioneering thing you've done which is which is not available uh, today you know you've spoken very candidly about your ability to take risk i want you to with your insights of indian industry explain to me why there isn't that much of a risk taking appetite in this country because we aren't really known for any big corporate brand or any big corporate product, right? I'm not saying this is a criticism at all of the Indian industry. We are still a very young industry compared to many other countries. Um, but if Apple could do the iPhone, yeah. where is the equivalent of that in India, or at least the ability of the equivalent of that over the next decade or so in India? So I would say it's a complex question. It has to do a lot with uh, the way we are brought up, our education system, where a lot of emphasis is given on memorizing things rather than thinking. So starting with education, then the way we've all been brought up in families which are conservative, where the parents don't want the children to fail. So that fear of failure is instilled many times by the parents themselves, you know. Mm. Indian society does not look failures positively, you know. So failures are dubbed as something. So the risk-taking ability because of the education, the way we've been brought up has, has limitations. On top of that, if you look at the business side of it, in the past, most businesses succeeded because they were able to get a license or they had to grease a certain, some politician. And that has been the historical side too. Now it's changing. Even the society is changing, the education system is not changing as much. Uh, the business side of government, dealing with government is changing, the ease of doing business and all is improving. But it will take time, you know, and on top of that you need to create a whole ecosystem of technology is playing a very important role in, in driving these innovations. So we are way behind in technology compared to what's happening in other markets. So whether it's technology or the ecosystem of developing innovations in India is has started moving, but we still have a long way to go uh, in terms of driving some big bang innovations. It's a matter of time. India will will arrive globally on a far more stronger wicket over a period of time, but it will take time. It has it has taken a long, long time for us to be in a certain mindset, whether the license maharaj or whether it is the education system or the way parents' expectation and all that will cannot be changed overnight. But it's a matter of time. I think over maybe 10, 15 years, we should see much more innovations coming out of India. The constraint mindset. Yeah. Any business leaders that you admire for their risk ability or their ability to keep falling down and Apple, get up? Apple has been the biggest, I would say, innovator. That one person, what he has done is sure. amazing, absolutely. I Besides that? I think today, another innovator which globally is most talked about is Elon Musk. You know, he has yes. thought about very, very differently in terms of uh, what he's trying to do. Mr. Mariwala, thanks very much for your insights. I hope this is the first of many conversations we have on failure and um, many in which you will join us hopefully thank, again. Thank, thank you very I'm much. I'm glad you're doing this and it's, I think it will be a lot of value to all the listeners. 
And I, I hope so. When people watch your life history <laughs> uh, and your ability to keep getting back up, that is inspirational. Not only me, but when you follow up this with the series of failures and uh, others have gone through it, I think it will be a great value addition. Thank you very much for Thank your time. You. Thank you. Right.